Hi, and welcome to this week's GMBN Tech Show. Right, coming up on the show, we have a look at that Troy Lee A3 helmet, along with some of the best footage from a launch video we've ever seen. Uh, there's Irish coffee from Steve Pete. Shimano are 100 years old. 100, making gears for 100 years, insane. And there's also a really, really cool project bike, a hot chili in Rewind from one of you lot. Amazing stuff. Okay, so let's dive straight into the show and let's talk about Shimano. Happy birthday, Shimano, 100 years old. Wow, so founded in March 1921 uh, by Shozaburo Shimano, who actually the first thing he made was a freewheel, a 3.3.3, um, and then never looked back, making just arguably some of the world's finest technical gear for bikes. And I applaud you. You've given me many wonderful experiences on bikes, and I'm sure a lot of you amazing viewers out there will, will join me in feeling exactly the same. 100 years, isn't that insane? Uh, so let's celebrate that and have a look at some of the cool stuff they've made. I've got a bit of a gallery here of some photos I've taken over the many years of some really cool stuff. And we're gonna start straight away with 1983, uh, the first Dior XT Geraldo, which was just known as uh, just Dior, basically. This is it on screen, and a few other products from the range on this beautiful old Rocky Mountain. I think it's a Sherpa. Um, I might be wrong, pretty sure it's a Sherpa. Uh, yeah, so 1983, 1984, probably the model of the bike. Uh, steel frame from Rocky Mountain. Beautiful piece of kit, but look at that mech with a deer head on it. So uh, it said basically Dior was uh, essentially a translation of um, deer. So I guess someone at Shimano uh, noted the fact that mountain bikers crossing through terrain would kind of be like a a deer, I guess, which I think that's a really nice way of thinking about it because you do kind of sit upright and, uh, well, yeah, it's lovely. So, of course, at Shimano, to start with, when they're making gears and that, they were actually doing stuff for touring. So all their touring gear range, which I guess you could arguably say is gravel riding these days, um, led to the Dior stuff. Now, of course, they gave us many amazing things over the years. Hopefully, there's a load of images just playing right now. I um, just want to talk about a few of the especially cool things. The SPD pedal. This in, undoubtedly is one of the greatest things Shimano released on the market. So at a time when you could use flat pedals and slip around and, and shin yourself, or you could use toe clips and straps and risk being attached to the bike when the ship goes down, Shimano brought out the SPD pedal because in the road world, they're using these huge cleats on their pedals and waddling around like ducks and stuff. And Shimano had the idea of having a recessed cleat. Amazing, overnight it transformed mountain biking. And I remember specifically, because I couldn't afford this one, which was the XT uh, M737, I had the 535, which was the DX version, which was smaller and it was actually lighter and better in the mud, uh, even though it was cheaper. But I remember the first time I put them on my bike, literally riding up and down the street outside my parents' house where I grew up, and it felt like I discovered fire. They were literally the coolest thing. It was like a line in the sand. The way you could ride a bike, even a poor bike off-road, it was just incredible because it was seamlessly part of you. And it's something that Shimano's worked on for years following on from that. Not just the, you know being part of the bike, but just the way that everything's so intuitive. They're rapid fire, rapid fire plus systems, hyperglide, hyperglide plus. There's just so much cool technology. And just look at some of the stuff. Whether it's old XTR, which of course is the racing version of the XT group set, um, or you know, you're talking about the new stuff, it's just beautiful, right? So here's a gallery. Um, I absolutely love this stuff. Now, a few of the things I especially like were airlines, which were only ever released in a tiny, tiny quantity. Um, if you want to hear about airlines, there's going to be a link in the description underneath for an old video uh, I made on, I say old, a video I made on those old things a few weeks ago. And then I guess the next thing up on there would be um, the clutch derailleur. Shimano gave us the clutch derailleur. How cool is that? So previously, there was no real way other than having a full-on chain guide of stopping your chain going wildfire on the bike, and Shimano brought us a clutch. It was like, just genius. And of course, SRAM have also got a clutch these days, and many other component manufacturers have joined the party, but it was Shimano that did it first. You know, it's actually hard to talk about Shimano from my perspective without it sounding like a bit of a love letter, because well, who well, am I kidding? This is, this is a love letter to Shimano. Um, I, I love the brand, I love what you do. Uh, the name is synonymous with cycling. And at some point, I really hope I can come and visit Shimano out in Japan. Absolutely, that would be a dream come true as far as my cycling career goes. But, uh, but look where they are now. So all of the technology that comes in at the top filters down. So 12-speed Dior, 
this this has actually got to be my favorite thing they've released in recent years because the quality is unbelievable for a budget it, it doesn't look budget it looks like high end and it performs like a high end transmission uh, but a great value price point and then you probably noticed i didn't really refer to di2 okay so di2 incredible stuff electronic transmission but um well there might be some developments coming who knows you know it's been long thought of that there might be some wireless stuff coming down the road from shimano but um well what would i know about that sort of thing hey hmm. well um what was your favorite shimano thing over the years uh, what do you love about what shimano has created uh, have you got a favorite thing you've owned or aspire to own uh, let us know in those comments in the meantime here's a few more shots Okay, so straight into news now, and uh, well, the first thing in news has got to be the Troy Lee Designs A3 helmet. So Troy Lee have made some super stylish, questionably some of the most stylish helmets of all time. And in fact, in next week's show or the week after, if it hasn't turned up in time, I'm going to talk to you about some of their early development stuff because I've got something very cool, uh, very rare coming, being sent right here to me. But this is all about the A3. So this is the latest and greatest helmet from them, designed for trail riding, enduro riding, all round mountain biking, essentially. So it's got 16 vents, it's got three piece construction uh, on the inside liner, which is a dual construction. So there's two materials used in a three piece design. Uh, so they use EPS and EPP. EPP is expanded polypropylene, EPS expanded polystyrene. So expanded polypropylene is for low speed impacts and polystyrene for high speed knocks, essentially. So it's kind of differentiating between the two, because let's face it, uh, we don't all just crash at high speed. Sometimes, you know, you hit by branches and other stuff. So uh, kind of cool that they've got that feature in there. Uh, three position magnetic Visor, MIPS liner system on there now. So you've got uh, rotational preventional, uh, rotational injury prevention built into the helmet now. A uh, Fidlock buckle system. Now, Fidlock stuff is brilliant. I've reported on Fidlock stuff quite a lot in the past. It's magnetic and it's really simple and really works. And emergency services know how to use that stuff as well. So it isn't something you should have to worry about. Uh, so quoted uh, weight for a size medium is 415 grams. Uh, price in the US is $220, it's 250 euros and about 200 quid here in the UK. And they pass all the standards they need to. And probably one of the coolest things about the helmet, other than the fact it's a really nice helmet with loads of cool vents, it's gonna do its job is the launch video strategy. I think this is amazing. So they've got this thing, you know, so comfy you won't take the helmet off. Uh, the first video is this one with Rob Warner, which I think is absolute gold. Bravo, Troy Lee Designs. Nailed it once again. Although one little observation with that video with Warner in it, it looked a little bit like he's wearing a toupee, did not it? When, they, uh, when the butler took the cap off and put the helmet on. Hmm. Next up in news is the availability of Canyon bikes now in Canada. Okay, so you still buy the bikes in Germany, but they can now get shipped there. They've sorted out all the logistics for figuring that out. Now, you might have thought this might be coming because of course they've had Mark Wallace riding the bikes for a while and they've now, of course, got Emily Batty on the team. So it should be some cool images uh, she's posted recently. Uh, really cool looking bike. Of course, I, I ride the Lux as well. Lovely cross country bike. And I hope to see her do really good things on it. And of course, uh, Laurie Arsenal as well on the XC Racing team there. Um, and it's really cool to see. So they're not bringing in e-bikes just yet though. Not that affects us here on GMB and Tech. Um, but I think that, you know, there's regulations you have to pass and uh, shipping the batteries essentially. So it is a bit of a logistical nightmare for any manufacturer to figure that one out. But still really cool that you can get Canyon bikes, which are great value, no doubt in Canada. Uh, one thing to say though, so they say warranty option either goes back to Germany or through Velofix they have a home mechanical service, uh, which is quite cool. Has anyone out there used Velofix? I don't really know anything about it. I'd like to know uh, if it's any good. Let us know in those comments if you have. Okay, next up is Petey's have got a new chain lube, which smells of Irish coffee. Now, I I actually qu questioned this one to start with, but I've got to remind myself again because uh, like that's actually ridiculous. <laughs> like it actually smells like Irish coffee. That's dangerous. That's actually dangerous how, how that smells. But um, knowing these guys, it's gonna be decent stuff. So they say this one is a, uh, it's a wet lube and it's got wax in the, in the formula. So you do have to put this onto a completely new chain. Uh, and apparently it's very good. Uh, what else? 60 milliliters at 7.99 or 120 mil at 11.99. Oh, they also do coffee as well. So they actually sent me, sent me some of their coffee. Um, 
with some Irish whiskey so I can have an Irish coffee later on. Although, just saying you'd think I probably had one with the way I'm speaking, but um, uh, been a bit hay fevery today. So I kind of like that because that means that good things are coming in the air, although I don't like the way it makes me feel. But uh, wet lube from Petey's, nice stuff. And what else have we got? Oh, something else that came through the post. Check these out. If you are a mint sauce fan, you might like a set of these gloves. Uh, these are from Handski. Uh, this is the Joe Burt signature one. Um, I've got a feeling they might temporarily already be out of stock because they sold so fast. They're just a super thin pair of riding gloves. They've got a little uh, little thing on the um, on your index finger there for touch screens. And that's about all you need to know. They put on gloves that don't have any bells and whistles. They retail for 30 quid in the UK. There's loads of color options on them, but uh, it's got to be the mint sauce ones. And if you don't know what mint sauce is, you have to look it up. Okay, so let's delve into comments from last week's show. Um, there, there was just so many. I was actually having a bit of a cry with some of these reading through them. Was, some were so painful, some were excruciating, and some were just like, wow. Okay, so uh, this one's from Dave Matthews. I unscrewed the air can from my rear shock before evacuating the air. The bike was in the work stand, shock was still in the frame. As soon as the air can was undone, the air can sleeve shot down and trapped my thumb between the can and the seat post tube. I stood for an hour and a half whilst I waited for my dad to come and save me and a fractured scaphoid. Oh, and a lesson learned. Oh man, I actually feel sorry for you. That's not even that funny because scaphoid is a bugger to heal. So you can't you like kill the blood supply somewhere when you bust your scaphoid. Nasty business, that. I hope you got better from that. Um, Brian Dale says, almost lost some fingers trying to see a tuber speed. The tire exploded in my hand. I've never seen a tire explode. I'm not sure I'd want to, to be honest. Uh, it does sound pretty funny. It says almost lost, so it's kind of all right. Uh, Joel Felton, once I was checking to see if my wheel's true, I spun the wheel super fast, chucked my thumb next to the fork as a point of guidance, and my thumb slipped straight into spokes, ripping the thumbnail completely off. Uh, it's had wheel PTSD ever since. Uh, Nathan Brown, oh, interesting. Access brakes can happen. Think about it. All you need is force feedback in the levers, like a PS5 already has. The tech is there, someone's just got to do it. But the thing is, would you want to have brakes where there's literally a lever and fresh air between the lever and the caliper? I'm not so sure about that because even when hydraulic brakes came into the system, the fact there wasn't like a metal cable that you were physically pulling, I think a lot of people are still like, oh, we know the theory and it does work in cars, but still you're just pushing a bit of fluid down a pipe. Can you imagine not having anything there at all? That is pure faith, although really cool. Uh, next one's from uh, Hadil. I was trying to get, oh, I've just sort of read this. This is bad. I was trying to get a grip by putting my screwdriver in the gap and the grip burst and then the screwdriver went through straight into my cornea. Oh, dude, what were you doing? Oh, it was scratched deeply and my vision was damaged. Jesus, sort your act out, mate. That is so unlucky. That is horrendous. If you're going to put a screwdriver for anything, do it away from you. Never do it towards you. Let that be a lesson. Uh, Rupert Wen. Hey, Rupert, you're a bit of a regular these days. Never cut a cable tie with a Stanley knife. I'm not going to finish that one. I think we know what happened there, don't we? <laughs> okay, um, and also for last week's comments, actually, loads of you were speculating on the forthcoming uh, release from SRAM. I'm just going to throw up the post that SRAM did again last week. Now, quite a few of you think it's GX Access. Well, a little birdie tells me SRAM are launching whatever this thing is tomorrow. I mean, I wouldn't possibly know what it is. I mean, maybe I do, but um, uh, if I told you Tram would kill me, maybe they'd send me some concrete wellies in a post. Who knows? But there's some really cool stuff launching tomorrow, so uh, wait and see what happens. Okay, quiz time, and seeing as it's Shimano's 100th birthday, let's have a Shimano-focused one. So the first question firing up on screen right now. What does SPD stand for? What is the name of Shimano's ultra smooth shifting pattern that they use on their cassettes? Now there's kind of two models, an older one and a more modernized one. Either of these will do. And the last question, what is the major difference? There are, there are a few, but what's the major difference between the clutch found on a Shimano mech and the clutch found on a SRAM mech? pick up the questions a bit later. In the meantime, let's dive straight into Bike Cave. This, of course, is the section of the show where we look at where you keep your bike, where you tuck it up at night, where you uh, give it a bit of chain lube, a bit of love, all that sort of stuff. Uh, if you've got a Bike Cave, send it in to us. Show us some pictures. I hear that Neil Donoghue over on GMBN has got a very flashy new one. Uh, so hopefully we'll feature his on a show soon. We'll get him to do a little, uh, little walk around and show us what it's all about. But in the meantime, 
Have a look at these, right, so let's just get this up on screen. Nice widescreen monitor with GMBN Tech on there. Uh, you've got your MIDI keyboard plugged in and you've got your electric guitar as well. Looking good. I'm liking this, a music, music room bike cave. This is real cool, Brian. Thank you for sending this in from California. That's where I hang out, watch GMBN, work on my bikes and make music. Dude, this sounds rad and it looks cool. Uh, I'm super impressed. I like your use of, um, I was gonna say your use of uh, a window ledge there, but you've made a shelf, especially for your bike, that looks like a window ledge. So that kind of fits in there really nicely. And I see the one at the back, you've kind of uh, just done it as two separate shelves so you can fit your toolbox in the middle with your Crank Brothers sticker, staying loyal to California there. Nice to see. Pretty packed out. Dude, I love the fact it's a music room as well. I'm really into my music as well, so I really appreciate that. Okay. Next one, unfortunately, there is no description with it. Oh my God, I can't believe this, but I'm gonna throw it on screen anyway. If this is your bike cave, let us know in those comments. I can't believe it's not come up with a description. Uh, but this is a little classic shed, and you've got a Boardman in there. I can't see what the other bike is, but I love a good old garden shed. In fact, I'm kind of desperate to have a shed myself. Um, you've got power in there by the looks of it. You've got your trunk in around the top there. You've got lights, all looking good. Classic shed, and it looks like you started to kit it out a bit better now. Looking good. Okay, so next one is from Lee with his Canevo Turbo 2018 in St. Helens. Inspired by Blake's bike cave build in, in the lockdown, um, I decided to build my own one. And it's called Dodd's Den, lockdown complete. Is your name Lee Dodd? Do you know what? This looks a bit familiar. I say I look familiar, I recognize that ground anchor. I feel like you've sent this in before. Um, but I'm gonna run with it because it looks really good and there's so many of these that come flying past us through the uploader. It's easy to look tra uh, lose track of them. But uh, yeah, I recognize the red swivel vice there, there's Bergtech bars, even the blue lighting that looks a little bit like um, a questionable nightclub. Yeah, but very cool though. Rewind, of course, is the section of the show where I get to go a bit old school and delve into mountain biking's past. If you've got anything cool whatsoever, or you want to know anything cool, get involved in the comments underneath or use our uploader. The link is right there. There's a click-through link in the description underneath. Now, the one I have on screen is insane. This is a hot chili. So coming up on screen are the shots, okay? So check this out. All right, so hot chili downhill bikes were massive in the 90s. I used to see them absolutely everywhere in all of the magazines and stuff. So I can see why it was definitely gonna be a dream build. So this is from Lars in, um, in Bornholm, in Bornholm, Baltic Sea. This is my dream bike, a super rare frame to find. I was gonna say, cause I haven't seen one since the nineties. Super rare frame to find. It took me ages to actually bag one and own it. Uh, this is serial number 20, wow. And probably the only blue one in existence. So I was gonna say, cause yellow was the color that everyone knew hot chili for. Uh, super cool though, dude. So I built it up more or less time correct. Uh, here are the specs, 24 inch sun, double wide rims. Man, I remember those things, they were huge. Hope big ones with lightning bolt rotors. Point racing stem, Hopi steering damper. No way. Okay, I look forward to seeing the pictures of this. Uh, lots of race face, physique freak saddle. Man, that, so those fr uh, freak saddles, there was, there was a, had no padding. The upper was made of plastic, had rubber uh, molded onto it for traction. I went to the product launch of that and that was in Solbach Hinterglem. And those saddles were provided in like, it looked like meat packaging. It was like the most bizarre thing. And I had Gareth Dyer, Cedric Grassi, all sorts of people. And Grassi actually, um, I think we'd all had a bunch of beers, a lot of beers, at the Gerbstall. Um, don't know if anyone knows that place. It gets a bit rowdy in there from time to time. And when you're up on the balcony outside, it's quite a drop down to the field underneath it. Grassi, He'd, he'd had one or two ales himself. He got the uh, one of the beer umbrellas and jumped off James Bond style, hoping that the umbrella would break his fall. And for a split second, we all were like, huh? It's actually worked. And then he just dropped like a stone. And he uh, nearly took his eye out on one of the little plastic shrouds around a, a, like a tree sapling. And they had to deal with the images for the freak campaign the next day. And if you look back at those images, uh, one of Grassi, he's got a black eye. And that's how he had that black eye. Uh, but it was cool, real good times hanging out with those guys. Uh, so SRAM, EXO gearing, Shockworks, DHRC Shock, Manitou 2005, Dorado as well, and a Mr. Dirt Gizmo chain guide. Man, 
look at the gear on this, right? So you've actually got a Roots chain cat and a chain dog on there, um, the upper and lower. Although, that's actually I lied, that's a roller coaster, that's the bottom one, because they did a chain cat and a chain dog, and you've got a roller coaster, which was the better one. Um, the chain cat was just a single roller, as far as I remember, that went around the chain. But look at the remote reservoir from the shock, the fact it's bolted onto the frame separately, so obviously there wasn't room for it in that sort of weird, sort of, I guess you'd kind of call it a semi monocoque design. Bizarre looking thing. Um, of course, classic single pivot. Look how much movement there is for the rear chain stays on that. That thing is awesome looking. Oh, and look at that original version there. So that is what they used to look like in the classic yellow. Uh, though that one's got great, great sort of fade to it. Reminds me of a Rocky Mountain RM actually, but uh, the Mr. Dirt fork on there. So that was one of the classic inverted forks. I actually completely forgotten about that. So yeah, your nod to the past by putting a Dorado on there is actually kind of bang on. Even though Dorado I think was a newer fork than those, but uh, oh, dude, super cool. Like really, really cool. And a few more hot chili shots there. There's some other bikes. Oh man, super cool. Thank you so much for sending that in, Lars. That's really good to see. And you're right, that's a pretty rare bike by all accounts. Now, if you've got anything old or retro, please get involved and send them in. Okay, now it's time for some quiz answers. How did you get on? Right, so first one was, what does SPD stand for? Shimano Pedaling Dynamics. Yeah, so Shimano bought what was in the road world already, the clipless pedal into the mountain bike world, uh, but made it usable on a mountain bike by having a recessed cleat design, which meant you could walk off-road uh, rather than the road approach, which has a huge cleat uh, getting in the way of walking and stuff. So uh, by all accounts, a bit of a terrible design because uh, we've since moved the same sort of system across into the road world as well. Uh, next up was what is the name of Shimano's ultra smooth shifting system on their cassette called Hyperglide. Yeah, they've had that for a long time, and more recently they've got Hyperglide Plus. So Hyperglide was a series of shifting ramps, basically, that you can see, and some profiled teeth. So they're designed to hook the chain on, to pull the chain up the cassette for basically uh, much smoother gearing, uh, shifting between gears, especially under power. You think when you're shifting up into a lower gear, you're generally like, you really need it, so you need the chain to hook and really pull its way up. So incredible system by, by Shimano there. And then Hyperglide Plus, they've actually introduced this to pull the chain back down again. So chain shifting would always be better slightly under tension i.e. shifting into a lower gear or up into those bigger size sprockets but coming back down it relied on the tension being gone um, and basically the well there was no tension to pull it down so it almost gravity fed so by having a hyperglide plus system they've encouraged these ramps to actually pull the chain back down the cassette and shifting is so much faster uh, an amazing system there and the last one was, what is the major difference between the clutch found on Shimano MX uh, and the one found on SRAM MX? Hopefully there's a Shimano picture and a SRAM one just to show you the difference here. The clutch design is totally different. So the Shimano one, you can turn it on and off uh, to ease removing the wheel from the bike. Whereas the SRAM one, you can't turn it on or off, it's permanently on, but they have a cage lock. So you can lock the lower cage uh, in order to remove the wheel. So different approach, but equally as effective. Uh, both systems are really, really good. Uh, so major props to SRAM and Shimano for those. Uh, how did you get on? Did you get those questions right? Let us know in those comments what you got. Uh, that's the end of this week's show. Hopefully you enjoyed the show and you enjoyed some of the stuff on there. Uh, and hopefully as long as you, know, you appreciated my love for Shimano because Shimano is unreal. So thank you once again and happy birthday to Shimano and we'll see you next week's show. Ta-ra.